Hey, it's Tommy Hodgins, and today I'm going to talk about what it takes to support a custom selector right from a custom designed piece of valid CSS through to it running in the browser and what that requires. And for an example, I'm going to look at the CSS selectors level four draft where there's a selector that I've wanted for a few years called has. Now what has does or what it will do is if an element has at least one other element matching the selector that you put in the has function, um, then it will match the original tag. So if there's an a tag that has an img tag as its direct descendant, then we could style that a tag somehow special. Now this has been in the spec for about five years and unfortunately there's absolutely zero browser support and I don't think that there's even intent to add this. This is something that they know that they want, they keep it in the spec, it's like a lofty goal, but we're not there yet. So what can we do about it today? So if we were to write something like ul has li in browsers today, they don't understand that, so they would just drop it. So we can't even write CSS that includes it and support it ourselves that way, but I don't think that we want to. I think what we want to do is find some way that we can either represent it in the browser in the way that the browser understands that we can work with or try to find some way that we can work with it that's very reliable and will work forever and so what i propose is that we use the syntax for custom selectors now these are also not supported by the browser yet but someday in the future this would be something that you could define a function for in javascript and support yourself so looking ahead, we can use either this syntax, uh, kind of using an attribute selector, but uh, making sure that we put a double dash so that this doesn't accidentally collide. I don't think there is a has selector on any tag, but that would match a has selector. So we kind of namespace it ourselves with this custom double dash and then put the other selector in here. But this is kind of gross. So let's do it the other way. And to do it the other way, like this, uh, requires us to have some way to parse CSS. So this was the hardest part of the whole process of supporting your own custom CSS. So I took Tab Atkins parse CSS project and I brought it up to ES6 and packaged it. It was as a common JS module and I made it an ES module as well and taught it how to stringify things. So not only could I parse the CSS, but I could also put it back into a string. So once I had that as a demonstration of what that could do, I built this tiny little pattern process CSS, which is a CSS preprocessor structure. You just give it a string of CSS to process. You give it a list of plugins, which are functions. And these functions return three types of things. And you can also give it data as input. So as it preprocesses, it can have access to different pieces of information. Now, all that this does is for each of the plugins, it's going to run the plugin with whatever the most recent CSS is. And then those three different things that it returns, uh, this does something special with the CSS. If there's any JavaScript generated, it does something special with the JavaScript and any other files that you create along the way can also be accumulated and output. So as a demo of what this kind of a preprocessor skeleton or structure could do, I of course had to make process CSS demo. So this is where a lot of the fun is. Um, this is just a command line, a node script that will, you can give it a string or a file, it'll read it, it'll process it, you've got some options. So it's just a basic demonstration of how you could write a command line preprocessor. And it uses uh, process CSS to run the functions. And process CSS, of course, um, it's all made to work together. So what we have here is we have a folder of transformations, and these are the plugins that for this demo I'm experimenting with. And one of them here is a has element selector. So this is all that's required when you're pre-processing a valid CSS file that has this custom syntax that we have created and we want to support. Uh, this is all that it takes to support that. Now this is not perfect, but it's definitely usable. 
So in this file, we're pulling in parse CSS. We're also pulling in a very simple pattern matcher. This is the JS runtime that once we have parsed and extracted everything that we need, this is what we run on the page to actually process the styles. So as things change and elements get added or taken away, um, we can keep this up to date. And so as you'll notice, that's not actually a lot. That's 12 lines of code. So on the runtime side of things, it's actually pretty simple. Now here, this is how we match it, extract it, and support it. So we parse all the CSS that's being passed in. We know that the pattern that we're looking for here is colon and then a function that, that has the name dash dash has. And we're looking for that in a rule selector. So if it is a qualified rule that has a selector and there is at least one of these found, and we only support one, um, we output a copy of that runtime so that we can support that in the browser. And then to the output JavaScript, we write a function call to this function that gives it the selector and also gives it the thing inside the has function. And then we put the rest of the rule out there. Otherwise, if there's no has selector found, we just output the CSS. So to see this live, I have a copy of process CSS demo online. So if we had something like UL, you can see that this is getting translated for a CSS only transformation. We can do click for CSS only. So you can see um, this is outputting exactly what we're putting in. Now, if we put has li, there's no CSS output because we are going to support this in JavaScript. So I'm going to click to view the JavaScript output, which is mostly what we want this tool for. So with just the UL, um, it's passing through this CSS, the same CSS that we'd see here, um, untouched. But if you ran this JavaScript, that CSS would end up on the page. If we do something like four px solid purple, we still have the plain CSS being passed through, and then JS and CSS is running that has element selector runtime, and it's extracted the selector this part here, and it's put the selector in the function as the second argument. And then all of the declaration list inside, right now there's only one, but we could do uh, multiple. And you'll see that this is getting added in here. So this is being supported now by JavaScript. And so all that we've included here, this is a function. And the two things being passed into it are JS and CSS and has element selector. And so you see that here, this is JS and CSS, the event-driven virtual style sheet manager. And then this is our has runtime. So I'm going to write a slightly different one and we'll test it. So I know that on this demo page, I have some HTML. Here I have a UL that has an LI that has an A tag. So if I write UL has an LI that has an A tag, and to that UL, I want to give a purple border. I can copy this output. I can run it on the page. And it's going to support exactly what I wrote. So I expressed UL has LIA. And that got that. And all of them on the page actually gained that. So you'll see another one here. And another one here. If we were to do something a little bit different. What do we have? There's a P with code in it. So we could write P has code as a direct descendant and say that that should be read. And none of the other P tags on the page other than the ones that also contain the code have turned red. So that's how we can support something that we see in a spec 
like has, and there's no implementation, this is just all that there is. So we don't want to try to write has and try to support it ourselves because the semantics, the naming, or the functionality of what it does could change before it actually does get implemented in any browsers. So the correct answer is to safely namespace it and use the future syntax for custom selectors so that someday um, it may be that we can just use this CSS directly in the browser and it will be parsed. And then all that we'd need to do is register a function like this with the browser to let the browser know this is how has selector works, my custom dash dash has, and then that would continue to work forever, even in situations where a real has selector was implemented in the browser. So when you safely extend CSS using your own custom syntax like this, this will always be safe. It will always do exactly what you support it to do. And although we can just write CSS today and don't even have to think about the JavaScript, don't have to write that, at some point in the future, this step of outputting JavaScript to support it um, would just be something done automatically in the browser. So hopefully what happens is this remains and this goes away and uh, someday this kind of thing would just work. So I know that that's not has exactly, and I know that it's not perfect. Like I can't do, um, you know, infinite stuff. Like I can't mix and match and do stuff like that. It's just one support per selector the way I've written it, but you can support it and you can get that working and you can use it. And uh, it, it feels really good to write a hundred percent valid CSS uh, works with all the CSS tools because it is 100% syntactically correct. I know that I'm not going to have any conflicts with where CSS is headed in the future. And I still now have the tooling that I can support it however I want to support it in the meantime or just forever. So hopefully that shows you one way that you can take an idea like a selector uh, right from a concept through to a runtime that you can be using in production. Thanks and hope you have a great day.